Well, what's the crack, everybody? How are you getting on? Island boy! I, just, I can't get that shitting song out of my head. It's so good. Welcome to Buckshot, everybody. Episode 205. Today being Friday, the 5th of November 2021. What's the crack? How are you getting on? Welcome, anybody brand new to the podcast. Have a gander. There's 204 other episodes there. Rakes for you to keep me interested. Uh, welcome. New Patreons we have this week as well. Fair play. There is, of course, a Patreon page, as there is with every podcast out there at the minute. My one, uh, you get Patreon exclusive stuff like a rabbit pod on Wednesdays, as well as the video to today's podcast. Yeah, as well, this Sunday, we're going to do a live show over to Tintinet. To tit tit internet? Tit internet. We're going to do a live show with the Patreons and we're going to have a bit of crack, a few drinks, and get loosey goosey. It's not recorded or anything like that, so it's, you know. You can uh, you can slag off whoever you want to slag off. It's all left on the pitch. It's good crack. So if you wanna have a gander in the show notes, or if you do follow me on any of the social platforms, typically Instagram is the best place to find me. Tom O'Mahony Comedy, you know yourself. Go through the old uh, link in the bio, and you'll find all sorts there. You'll find, you know, the Patreon page. You'll find YouTube stuff. You'll find merch. You'll find the other podcasts I'm involved with. It's 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 an all. One stop shop, as they say. So, that's the crack. If you do have a chance, if you're still, you know, haven't skipped ahead and you're listening, and you can, uh, you know, leave a review, that'd be great. If you can, on whatever platform you're listening to, if it's Apple Podcasts, I think it's really the only one that you can. There's a couple others, I think, but Apple Podcasts, if you can leave a review, leave a five star review, and maybe write a little note. If you can't do any of that, would you do me a favor? Would you? Would you screen grab it? And just tag the podcast or tag me in it on whatever platform you're, you know, you're favoured in. And you can find me. Like I said, Instagram is probably best. It just gets the word out there. Shares it with the folk. Bring more on board for the Patreons because it makes the live shows even more. The more juicy people we have on board, the better. Ah, a couple of shows coming up on the 18th. I'm in Clanmel with an absolute banger of a lineup. I'm there with Sinead Quinlan, Paul Crowley and Jim Elliott. That's, that's going to tidy in anybody's book. The last Wednesday, I think it's like the 24th, 25th, and I, last Wednesday anyway, of this month of November, I'm in the University Concert Hall, Punchline Comedy Club, with the one and only Mickey Bartlett. Now that's a fucking night. That's going to be a night. Myself and Mickey in UCH. And that weekend, the last weekend of the of November, I'm going to be in the Laughter Lounge on the Friday and Saturday. So they're, they're all there for you, lads. They're all there for you. You know? So get your tickets in. I wish I... I should have really written down the actual dates, shouldn't I? I should have actually... Jesus Christ, what's wrong with me? Anyway, live show this Sunday. If you're a Patreon, it only takes a couple of minutes. It does it even. I think you've been in and out in 30 seconds if you pay, PayPal. You're on... You know, you're off to the races. Tom and Jerry show. People have been messaging about the Tom and Jerry show. Yes, it is making a comeback. We have powwowed. We already know what... Uh, probably about six of the episodes are going to be. So we'll be recording that fairly soon. Because I'm starting to miss old McBride. You know... Starting to miss him. So, we'll be getting that back on the track. Don't worry one bit about that. Uh, everything else is, is on track. You're up to date on everything. Just follow me on the usual platforms and you'll be all good. There you go. So, moving on to today's guests. Uh, I managed to gig with this man for the first time. I've heard of him alright because it's such a good name. But uh, I gigged with him at a show we did in the Laughter Lounge. A secret show we did in the Laughter Lounge. It's secret to the point that they, they won't put it on. It's being sold through a streaming service, I think. And it's not on sale yet, so we're not really talk about it. So, but he had an absolute killer set, and I've started following him since. And he's a very, very funny man. Just great, great crack. Very, very interesting fellow. Like we had some crack chatting that night, and you just knew, interesting man. He's going to be great stuff on the podcast. And I wasn't wrong. Absolutely powerful, powerful crack hanging out with Tamar Katan. What a name. Welcome to the podcast, Tamar Katan. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Without doubt, and there's no searching through the 200 and odd episodes I've done, without doubt, the coolest name that we... Oh, thanks. <laughs> Dude, I, I feel the same way about your name. Oh, really? Tom no. O'Bahoney, that is, that is the coolest name. I, yeah, they made it pretty simple on me there, Tamar. Okay, my initials are my first name. It's not... They, yeah, they weren't That's expecting true. it. They were... <laughs> See that that's super cool to me because I, I you know living in New York I had a friend who's an Irish kid Irish American different than you guys 
And his dad was a homicide detective from Queens. And this kid, like every time we'd go to over to his, over his house when we were kids, he'd be like, oh, see that table over there? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, it's murder furniture. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm like, what's murder furniture? He's like, oh, sometimes my dad investigates a murder. And if the guy doesn't have any family and it's a nice table, he'll bring it home. <laughs> so they... <laughs> That's the most fucking so, Irish thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so they're like random pieces of furniture. His name's Christopher Carley. He's a comic in New York. He's one of my best friends. So like all around their house, they'd have like different random pieces of murder furniture <laughs> that his dad would... <laughs> That sounds exactly like my old man. He'd be like, but sure, I mean, he's not using it. I mean, come on, it's... it's." Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so to me, you guys are super exotic because my name in, in my country is like Tom. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, I'm Egyptian. So t- actually, Tamar's a Turkish name. Oh, yeah. But, Do you know, yeah. it's funny you say that because something happened my Google, right? Back every every year, there's a thing called Shop de Nguelga, which is the week of Irish. And everything... You know, that's national. They try and put a little Irish spin on it to try and, you know, reinvoke the accent, the, the, the national language and all the rest of it. It's just a diddly diddly dee, you know. But Google will change, like all your Google. And you can ask for it to change back to all English, you know, across the top where it says oh, yeah. news, images. Well, it, and mine didn't change back. No, it's supposed to change. And I typed in, you know, I was looking, looking for, I was actually looking for a picture for you for later on the week when I put this out. And I typed in Tam- Tamarca and they, for some reason, thought, oh, you obviously want to translate these words you've written down. Tamarca <laughs> Well, you know what's funny about my name? My first name is Tamar. But when I performed in France, I didn't realize that my name in French means your mother. <laughs> <laughs> your <Ta-mer. mama. laughs> Ta-mer. Like, and, and then there was one time I performed with an English comic named Nick. And when you put our names together, Nick Tamer means F your mother. Nice. nice it's crazy that my name that are a cop, my name alone is kind of an insult you could go up to someone in the street and go Tamer, and they'll like start a fight with you. <laughs> yeah it's, it's basically saying your mama basically yeah yeah exactly because Kat- <laughs> katan then that was the one they it didn't know what to do with with tamar but it with katan for some reason it went oh you want to change from turkish bypass english and go straight to irish and then go and it actually means on Ulor, which means from the floor. <laughs> so you're. So, oh, that's funny. Because so yeah, it means in each in uh, Egyptian or, or Egyptian Arabic it comes from cotton. Because our family was like uh, Egyptian cotton manufacturers, like right. way back. Yeah, so it means cotton. And when did you when did you move to the states then from Egypt? Because I know you told me because we did a show that what well, isn't released yet for the laughter lounge yeah. that we're not allowed to talk about just yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure we're fucking allowed to talk about, but. Um, when did you move to the States then? I was eight, eight when I left Egypt. My dad left first actually for America and lived there for almost a year and a half before we came because he wanted to go and like save money and stuff. We didn't know how scary it was going to be or how, how hard it was going to be. Yeah. Because, yeah. and what part of Egypt did you grow up in? In uh, Cairo, Cairo and Alexandria. But like my, my, my people come from Alexandria because my, I'm part Greek, like my grandmother's 100% Greek. She's like red haired, green eyed, barely spoke Arabic. And Alexandria was a lot of Greek people live there because it was the place where Alexander the Great lived with Cleopatra. So, hence your awesome mustache. I mean, we, it, Jesus, man. That's... <laughs> yours is pretty badass too. I mean, it's, yours is it's all right. like bounty hunter and professional <laughs> wrestler. I don't That's know. awesome. I don't know. It happened. Do you know? It, it, I didn't. You know, when you just don't plan a thing out, you're like, well, let's see where to stop it. And it just kept on. <laughs> <and> just... <laughs> well, it's awesome, man. I'm envious of it. Because you have like a 1902 boxer look going on, you know, where. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that I do because my wife is like really big into Tom Selleck. And I didn't know. <laughs> I think I think when she convinced me to grow the mustache, she's like, yeah, you look like Tom Selleck. The only thing that happened is kids in the street just kept yelling, it's a Mario. And I'm like, and the whole time I was going for Bronson. I didn't get either. I wanted Bronson. She wanted Magnum P.I. And we got Mario. There's definitely Bronson there. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely see Bronson who's been on holidays, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Bronson after some therapy. Because you, because you, God bless you. I've shaved my head a bunch of times and I'm not far off needing it soon enough permanently but you have a great shaped head i'm, oh, I'm thanks, jealous 
I'm, I, I've got dents all over my head and stuff. I make small <laughs> children cry when they look directly at me. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, I got lucky. I had a mom with OCD, so she was constantly turning my head, <laughs> rolling me around in the bed. I think mine is self-inflicted from being a childhood of uh, growing up in the countryside of, oh, did I fall off that thing? That's basically oh, it's, it's that, the album of my life. Did I, did I just fall off that thing? That's awesome. I like that. Oh, well, it must be like it must be some wet towel to the face to go from Cairo slash Alexandria to New York. Oh, it? oh, yeah, man. It was so weird. Like I used to tell my friends all the time moving from Egypt to America wasn't like moving to another country it was like moving to the future <laughs> like, really oh man like i hate when my mom will post pictures of me from when i was a kid because it looks like i was born in 1912 <laughs> like like e- egypt was just so bad like all my toys used to make me bleed like they, <laughs> they, were, they were like metal and rusted and like smelled of gasoline like they were just like <laughs> egypt was just awful man like it was then you get to America and it was like, I remember we, we got to America and like we were in a shopping mall and it was the first time we'd seen an escalator and I was a kid. So I just like, I'm like, oh, this is just moving stairs. It looks fun. And my mom's like, no. And she like pulled me and I fell down the escalator. It's cursed. Like, <laughs> yeah, man. Like she, it was a big move in, in a lot of ways for sure. And culturally, it's just, you could not have a more different culture. Like American from Egyptian to American is so different. I can only, yeah, I can only imagine because we had a, as many Irish families grown up with the American cousins, you know, who are like yeah. second generation or whatever. And they'd come home at summer, you know, during the summer or whatever. And Jesus, you know, they're rocking like Miami Dolphins jackets. And it's 1980s Ireland, you know, where, yeah. <laughs> where you're rocking your older sister's jumper, basically. Yeah. So I can. And yeah, that, that was me in Egypt. When I'd go to Egypt, they, I, I guess I was the Irish version of the kid in the, in the yeah. Dolphins jumper. You know, even when I, it's funny because I left Egypt when I was eight. So when I go back, I, I went back during the, the, the Arab Spring, during right. the protests, and I performed there during the protests. It was crazy, like fires in the street, buildings on fire, like crazy political graffiti. And I remember we were at this dinner at this big restaurant and I told my uncle, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And he's like, I'll go with you. And I'm like, you don't need to go with me. I'm like, I'm, I'm fucking, I'm a covered in tattoos box they're like come on from new york like you don't need to go with me and i speak arabic he's like okay he's like well the re- bathroom's far i'm like i speak arabic don't worry about it but i left egypt when i was eight so my arabic is different it's an eight-year-old's say. arabic <laughs> it, that's exactly right so i'm walking across this huge hotel you know and i'm i go up to this guy and i'm like inevitably i couldn't find the bathroom so i asked this waiter i'm like hey excuse me where's the bathroom and he just starts laughing and I'm like, what? And he goes, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. It's, it's straight down that way and then to the left. I go, can you just tell me, why are you laughing? He's like, where are you from? And I go, I'm from here. He goes, no, you're not. And I go, no, I'm, e- I'm Egyptian, but I, I live in New York. He's like, oh, your accent's awesome. And I go, but what, what do you mean my accent? Is that why you're laughing? He's like, no. He's like, you wanted to say, where's the bathroom? And I go, yeah. He goes, what you actually said is, I have to go pee-pee. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> so this grown man sleeved in tattoos with a <laughs> scar next to his eye. I'm like, excuse me, I have to go pee-pee. <laughs> Where can I go pee-pee? <laughs> that can go one of two ways. Kind of just like, oh, that's cute. Look, he's from, but also you could be creeped out by going, oh, there's a tattooed man staring at me, telling me he needs to go pee-pee. Oh, yeah, man. I, I think he thought I was like special needs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Where are you coming to us live from today? I know I sound like I'm speaking on the fucking Eurovision here, but <laughs> but you are kind of, I mean, you are the Eurovision man. You're, you have, like your base is in three different places typically, isn't it? Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I'm actually in London now. I just, uh, last night was a big uh, com- milestone for me. I opened for Eliza Schlesinger at the Apollo. Ooh. It was, oh, oh, tell it was, us about that. That yeah, was, it was incredible. Fucking hell, full house yeah. playing to that. That's a big ass stage. Full house, 5,000 people. It was like such a bucket list yeah. Uh, moment. Yeah, it was very, very cool. And yeah, man, I mean, I got married during the pandemic, you know, and, and leaving New York for me as a comic, terrifying. Of course. You know, I was really scared to go. But my wife is like from the woods in Sweden. And 
dude, like what, what, what she was living in Barcelona. I don't know if I told you this whole story, but like I, I met her over Bumble when I was in New York. And cool. when I was a kid, I didn't have a lot of money. So I used to use YouTube to kind of virtually travel, you know, yeah. and just like visit the places I'd want to go to as a way to motivate me to work hard and stuff. And I was in New York and man, New York during the pandemic was terrifying. Was it, really? I lived, was it? Oh, dude, man. I lived in the Lower East Side. So I was like, you know, in, in the lower part of New York, but uh, at the end of Manhattan, right before the Brooklyn Bridge. So one side of me was Chinatown. The other side of me was the projects that Jay-Z grew up in. Oh, you know, it was. And so when the, during a normal life in New York, there's so much noise from normal people that you couldn't hear the noise from the crazy people. Yes, I'm with you. Right? Yeah, yeah. But then when the when the normal people got quarantined, all of a sudden you could hear the crazy people. So <laughs> all night I could hear gunshots. I could hear homeless people having sex. I could hear people fighting in the streets, people getting stabbed. Like it was intense, man. And I was in this tiny little room in the Lower East Side so I just got on Bumble and Bumble had this feature called Passport where you could put yourself anywhere in the world. So I think it was like, like I knew to do that mentally. Like I needed to escape the way a sick dog eats grass, you know, like yes. it just knows like, this is what I need to do. So I did that and didn't think I'd meet anyone, but I met this Swedish girl and that was living in Barcelona and we like, we spoke for like six hours a day. Cause we were both quarantined, you know, right. yeah, yeah. We really got to know each other. And I had like an, like a backwards profile. I just wrote all the things about me that sucked because I didn't think I was going to meet anyone. You know, I just wanted to have a give us a snapshot. What are, what are we talking here? Like, oh, I'm like, if, I'm like, you got, you're inevitably going to ask, why am I single? Here's why I'm single. I'm selfish. I'm defensive. Uh, I was abused as a kid. Uh, so I'm hyper defensive. I go, uh, yeah, I go, I'm 49. Uh, I, 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 and I grew up rough. I grew up, punk, you know, I, I'm still into punk rock music. Uh, I, I love stand-up comedy. That's what I do for a living. So it's a little bit like being a single dad uh, <laughs> and, and comedy is my kid and my kid is a brat. And so people don't want to date me. I go, you know, that. and she kind of wrote back with a very similar profile going, Hey, I'm selfish too. And I had a rough childhood and I also love comedy. And she had a tattoo on her forearm that said, it's good to be the king which is a, a line from a Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, I, and I, she looked just like Pippi Longstocking to me. She had, <laughs> you know, really bright red hair and, and like beautiful blue eyes and like this like silky, milky skin. I sound like such a murderer right now. <laughs> yeah, just gonna say, <laughs> you're teeing her up. This is... <laughs> oh, dude, but she was just the polar opposite of me, you know? Like I felt like she was from another planet. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And we just hit it off and she was so funny and stuff. And we just talked every day. And then she told me that her flatmates because of the pandemic uh, had moved back to Germany. So she was living alone in this apartment in Barcelona and her and I both had COVID immediately and recovered from it. So back then it was like, yeah, we were like, dude, I was walking around New York taking the subway because I was recovered. So I was on the subway alone I was walking through time, an empty Times Square. It was like being Will Smith. That's some apocalyptic shit, isn't it? It was wild. Dude. I've got some crazy videos that I could send you of me alone in a subway, like just alone, you know, because I was like, I'm 100% safe. You know, that's what they said back then. Yeah. So she said, hey, why don't you come to Barcelona and stay the summer with me and we'll get to know each other after three months of talking six hours a day. So I'm like, fuck it, let's do it. So I got on a plane. Uh, the law said I could. I had a piece of paper from the doctor saying I was recovered and would had zero chance of getting COVID again. That's what the paperwork said. And I got through London. They stopped me at every border saying, what are you doing? You can't do this. And I'm like, yes, I can. Here's a paper from my doctor. And here's a QR code from, from the government in Spain saying that I can. And then I went through LA, went through London, got to Barcelona. And then she was 500 feet away from me. And the border is like, no, you can't come in. And I'm like, yes, I can. And they're like, no, you can't. The law changed two days ago. Oh, f and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, this is from your website. And they're like, no, we're sorry. If you would have had a direct flight, we would have let you in. But because you had a layover in London, you can't come. And they, they got my suitcase. They, and then they said, now you have to come with us to jail. 
and they made me dude it was crazy they made me spend the night in, yes sir they made me spend the night in jail they searched through my luggage they they uh took all my passport i spent the night in jail the next day they i had to fly home they walked me onto the plane police escort handed the after the plane was fully loaded they handed my passport to an airline attendant everybody's looking at me like i was a, a criminal because <laughs> cops escorted me to my seat and then uh two days later because my dad was in a beatles cover band i knew a lot about the beatles and i knew that john lennon married yoko ono in gibraltar and that gibraltar was technically spanish soil owned by brits so we two weeks later we met in gibraltar and we got married the day we met stop yeah man yeah well it was supposed to be the day we met i asked her to marry me the day we met and then we were going to get married two days later but instead because of covid even uh fedex and dhl couldn't ship her birth certificate in from sweden so we had to wait because sweden everything's digital in sweden but gibraltar's like no we need a physical birth certificate so we ended up staying two weeks in gibraltar until she got her birth certificate then we got married and then we walked across the border drove to spain and and that's that's kind of how our story started <laughs> that's so funny and you just sprinkled in there for good crack you were like and by the way, the old man was in a Beatles cover band. Anyway. Well, the, the reason for that is I have a picture. We got married in the exact same spot as John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And there's a there's I have a picture where it's John Lennon and Yoko Ono in a black and white picture. And then me and her in a color picture in the exact same spot with the Rock of Gibraltar, like right behind us. That's unbelievable. That's wild. dude. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, at some point, though, because it. I imagine you in jail and you've got that mustache and shaved head and you're gone, you know, what? and you're handy with your fists. It was like, maybe you should go, maybe you should, what are you doing? Just go full hardy. Go full. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was pre mustache, but oh. I had like my, when he opened up my bag, I had like full boxing gear in there. Cause I was, I was like, Oh, I'm going to continue boxing. Cause in New York, I, I boxed every day and i worked at a boxing gym during the day and and did comedy at night like a famous boxing gym in new york and uh so they looked at people didn't fuck with me because i didn't sleep on the pillow i slept on my boxing gloves so they're like oh this guy can fight then yeah. nobody fuck with me <laughs> say no more say no more yeah and when did when did you take up boxing then oh since since i was a kid really Even my dad my dad was golden gloves really yeah yeah while being in the beatles cover <laughs> this is he was a madman. I was in Golden Gloves. He was. He was a madman. Still, though, at the same time, it's nice to take up something like boxing early doors, isn't it? Like because. Oh yeah, definitely. Especially when you're an immigrant kid uh, from a country that people don't like in a in a country that people don't like. You know, like in America, they didn't m much care for Arabs even before 9/11 or any of that stuff. Like when I was a kid, I remember watching the news, and if they talked about gas prices on the news, I'd be like, "Oh shit, I'm going to get jumped." Because, yeah, because what would happen is these American parents would be like, oh, gas prices are up. Goddamn Arabs. And then the kids would come to school and go, I know one of those. And then they beat me up. They try to beat me up. Christ almighty. Yeah. What what a thing. Like, you know what I mean? You know, some kids yeah. just have to get out. You know, I've got a bit of a list. I better sort that out. You yeah. should go up in your because gas prices got raised in another continent. You're like, what? Yeah, I didn't fucking raise them. Like It was crazy. <laughs> It was nuts. Like I literally would watch the, it was like a weather report for meetings. I'd watch the news and be like, Oh, if they talk about Arabs, I had to worry, you know? <laughs> so, and, but then you, you properly settled down and everything. Cause you, you, is it Spain? You bought the house? No. So what was happening was when we were in Barcelona and when we were in Barcelona, <laughs> the thing that drove me crazy is that she'd already lived there for eight years. So I'd be like, Oh, let's go do this. And she's like, ah, that's tourist shit. And I'm like, okay, yes. let's go do that. She's like, oh, that's no good. And I'm like, God damn it. I just moved here. <laughs> and she's, and I'm like, maybe we need to move to a place together. And then, you know, the stuff with Trump got really bad in America. My mom had an accent and I knew I wanted her to move to Europe. And Portugal just had, you know, a great combination of things where it was really easy for my mom to move there if she bought property. So we went and looked in Portugal. We found a place that we loved and we, we bought a place there. And my mom bought a place 20 minutes away by train. So we kind of relocated there. And then the deal was she, uh, Anna already had an apartment in Malmo. And then I had like a little place in London. So that's how come we're in three places now. It was like we have where we rest is Lisbon. 
Um, and then where I work as far as comedy goes is I perform comedy in English in you know London and UK and and now I'm learning Swedish so I can perform in Swedish in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> I love it. I, have I mean, Swedes speak English perfectly well. I don't need to do it in Swedish, but I, I want to. And uh, of course, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, I've been doing joke. I did a I did a show where every comic was Swedish and I was the only one in English. I did one joke in English and the room exploded. Oh, I'm sorry. I did one joke Sweet. in Swedish and the room exploded. Yeah. And I was of like, course, okay, this is cool. You're enamoring yourself to the locals straight away. Yeah. Those beautiful bastards that they are. <laughs> they Lord. really are. It drives me crazy. It's amazing how rapists can become so good looking and civilized <laughs> centuries later. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, I suppose they they picked the finer points that they wanted to pick. You know, I'm sure there were some ugly ones back in the day. You know, they scooped up a few good looking ones and just or whatever they happened to do. But good Lord, they, uh, they're good looking people. But yeah. I think I think I don't know. What did, what did I hear you saying it before? It was like, yeah, but, you know, like you can be exotic in anywhere you go if you're a bit odd, you know? Yeah, because definitely I, a guy a guy I hadn't seen in years. He just. He, he messaged me on Facebook maybe about two or three months ago. It's just about a thing. And I hadn't seen this guy since I was like 17, 18. And he was a big old unit. He played rugby with me and stuff, but he was a fucking tank. He looked like a fridge with red hair, big thick glasses. And he was always kind of angry and stuff because I suppose he, you know, he was whatever. I remember he was a bouncer. And out of nowhere, he just disappeared off the face of the earth. Nobody fully knows. I didn't see him in Asia. And he turns up and he's, I looked at his profile picture. And he's fully in Japan, like has been like 15 years. Wow. But he's full, you know, Japanese wife. He's in full gear and everything in the, in the picture. And I'm chatting. I was like, what fucking hell, man? How did this? He goes, went there just for the hell of it, just to teach English for like a month. Loved it. And he's, I said, well, what did you love about it? He's, I was the coolest thing with for miles. <laughs> My big fucking red head walking around. Yeah. And people were just looking at him like he was Godzilla too, because he's like 6'6", six, six, you know, 6'7". Six, this beast walking down the road with a big fiery red, red hair so immediately it was the most interesting thing totally. which he'd never been before i think it's good for the planet man I, I think it's a really healthy thing for people to live in places they're not supposed to live oh yeah you know, oh 100 you know? yeah they, another mate of mine he was they were in just pre-lockdown they'd been in in china they were at the they were at some tourist you know thing whether it's the great wall or whatever but they kept on getting stopped because while he is American and he has a sallow skin and stuff, his wife, who's Irish, snow blonde hair, blue eyes, she kept on getting stopped for photographs with her. Forget about the fucking Great Wall. It was the oddest. She's like, what is going on? <laughs> That's they're hilarious. Like, they're just pointing, going, ha, you know, delighted. <laughs> I've met this woman who's so different. They're like, I've met a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You know what's so funny? I don't know why it's so cute when Japanese people do it, but when white people do it, it's so racist, right? Oh. Like, I've had Japanese people come up to me, look me dead in the face and go, oh, like that. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you can't do that. Like, you can't do it the other way. But it no, is No, you cute. can't. It's so cute when they, even, even in London, I said this the other night, like even toxic masculinity is cuter in a foreign country. Like in America, it's like grab her by the pussy, but in London, it's like grab her by the fanny. Like, oh, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> that's so much cuter. Yeah, I yeah. All right, I mean, you know, if you did it in Bronson's accent, though, that's the only thing it changes. It, you know, yeah. It's, yeah. If you do look at Devon accents, like, grab her by the fanny. It that's cute, but you do it like a fucking East End. Grab her by the fucking fanny. It, it changes the gear. Jeez. It's scary. <laughs> yeah, it makes me cross. It makes me even cross my legs when I heard that gravel on your voice. <laughs> I've told about 17 people about this. What a way to live. Bouncing between, was it, it's Copenhagen, isn't it? And, yeah, well, or is it Malmo? Mal well, Malmo, but it, it's funny because the close, I mean, Malmo is like the second biggest city in Sweden, but it's so close to Denmark that my wife's accent is even hard for me to understand. I understand Swedish, but her accent has so much Danish in it. Because her house is only 20 minutes away from Copenhagen, but hours away from Stockholm and, and a couple hours away from Gothenburg. No, Malmo is the third biggest city, I think, because there's Stockholm, Gothenburg, and then I think Malmo. But yeah, her accent has so much Danish in it. They call it Skånska or Skåne in the south of Sweden. And her, they, they're very Danish. And uh, yeah, it's only 20 minutes over the bridge. And now that they built the bridge, Copenhagen and, and Malmo are like 
you know, it's, it's as if you live in the same place. But bounce, I mean, bounce between all three. So is it a set? Do you do a set week in each, in each, like, or what way do you work it? Yeah. I mean, the game plan now is what, what I told Anna was like, you know, after the thing started opening up, the calendar was going to control me till the end of the year. I just had to like, let people know, I just get on the radar yeah, and let people know that I live here now. I'm not just, cause I, I was coming in every August and I'd stay for the month when everybody else was at the fringe, I I'd come and work and, you know, and, and headline clubs around like the UK. And so now I was like, I have to let people know that I live here and I have to let them see me. Cause you know what it's like oh, when yeah. people see you perform live, it's a lot different than you sending a, a stupid clip, yeah. you know, yeah. of your comedy. So, um, so yeah, the, the goal was to just to gig as much as possible. And my wife's been amazing about it. She's been super understanding. And then come January, I think the plan's going to be two weeks every month in London, one week every month in Sweden, and then uh, one week at home and writing and being together. And the nice thing is she works remotely. So she can meet me in Sweden um, for one of those weeks or meet me in London for one of those weeks. So, so we're together two weeks a month and then I'm on the road two weeks. And it's a, it's a gorgeous spot too you got in, in Portugal, wasn't it? Oh, uh, we're so lucky, man. It was such a freak accident too. Like it's on the street where they invented Fado music. What? which is like yeah man it's which is like the most calming music because it's music that, that that this famous prostitute sang about a man that was away on a boat that she missed so it was about like something that you lost that you don't think you'll ever get back so it's like right. this it's kind of like portuguese blues in a way yeah 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 and, yeah and our street is filled with photo houses so at night when we're going to bed you could just faintly hear photo singers singing in the street it's crazy. It's <laughs> it's the oldest neighborhood in all of Portugal. It's called Alfama. And it's like really windy streets. And like there's a cathedral on one end and a, a church on the other end. And we weren't supposed to get it. Like basically I was walking through the street and I saw a sign uh, and I messaged my realtor and I said, hey, I found this place. And she said, oh, yeah, it's really weird. It's four bathrooms and two bedrooms. And I was like, what? <laughs> So I messaged Ann and I'm like, hey, this place looks dope and the street's amazing. It's a it's a private street in a very touristy area, but it's private. You, you can only, you have the remote control where the pylon goes up and down, right? And and I go, it's beautiful. And she goes, yeah, but what are we going to do with four bathrooms? What are you, gonna, <laughs> you know, what are we going to have an office where you sit on a toilet and a desk? Like, it doesn't make sense, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And I called the realtor and it just kept bugging me. So I called the realtor back. I'm like, why would anyone have four bathrooms and two bedrooms? It doesn't make sense. And she goes, you're right. She called the realtor. The realtor made a mistake. And the house wasn't getting any offers because everybody thought it was four bathrooms and two bedrooms. So when we came in and made our offer, they accepted it right away because they had just lowered the price. So we got so lucky. So, so they'd written it the wrong way around. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and and it was you- like, we couldn't have afforded anything more. So we got really lucky, but we loved it. And has your mother moved over with you? Yeah, she lives in an area called Carcavelo. It's like uh, 20 minutes by train. Nice little beach town. She's already got more friends than we do. It's crazy. Of course. Of course. Yeah. 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 She's like super friendly. And like the first week she was there, she was sending me pictures from the beach where, with her hand on her hip. And I'm like, who, well, who's taking your picture? She's like, oh, this is my friend, Anne. I'm like, who the fuck is Anne? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't, she's friends with people that don't even speak the same language. Like, she, I don't know if they're like just sign languaging each other the whole time. It's bananas. But yeah. She's a very friendly sort and she's, she's made so many friends already. It's great. That's brilliant. But yeah. did, did, what, did I remember correctly? Did you say you, did you sell a cartoon? Or what? Yeah, I was part of a cartoon that got sold. Yeah. To, to NBC. That's so cool. Yeah. I'm stoked oh, about it. What, what cartoon was it? It's called Tantrum Jesus. But I, <laughs> uh, basically the premise is everybody knows about Jesus's life as an adult, but nobody knows about his life as a kid. And, yeah, uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, and then like, and since his mom was a human being, we, we thought his big flaw, human flaw, was his inability to control his temper. But <laughs> since he was the son of God, when he lost his temper, terrible things would happen. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, the the world the the world of Bethlehem is is so fun to play with. So we've been having a lot of fun with it. And then I sold my portion, but I still help out with the writing and the rewrites and uh, it's, it's looking good. So far, so good. That's class. 
Oh, wait, oh, wait, at what stage then did you? So you're you're a young a young Egyptian lad fucking fighting <laughs> fighting for, for your life basically. But what stage then? Like were you obviously the boxing and stuff? Were you sporty? You know, the, it, it, other than that. No, I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I was a sporty kid, like genetically. It's kind of a weird thing uh, being Egyptian because it is in Africa. So we've got some yeah. good genes. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. like I, I was always like a strong kid. Like I was always a, a really strong kid. And, you know, even it's funny. The first time I played American baseball, I'll never forget this. I was playing American baseball. I didn't know how to how to play. They put me in T-ball where you put a ball on it, on it, on a, on a thing and then you you hit it. And then I. I'd always just hit it lightly and run to the base. And then one time the coach goes, Hey, okay, we're at this practice. Is there any, anybody who hits it into the outfield, you get to hit again. Like right. it's a reward. Right. Okay. And then I looked at the coach. I'm like, Oh, do you want me to hit it far? And he, goes, <laughs> and he just looked at me and goes, yeah, hit it far. That's what I want. He's like, if you can hit it over the fence. I'm like, Oh, I didn't know that. And he goes, you didn't know that. And I'm like, no, and he goes, okay. So then I went, and I'm like, whack. And I hit like a home run. And he goes, Jesus. He goes, can you do that, that again? And I go, yeah. And I just like every, <laughs> I was just whacking home runs. And then the coach was like, holy shit. He's like, what do you feed this kid? And so I became like this star baseball player in school, went from T-ball into, and I played all the way through like college, but I, I was good at hitting shit. <laughs> yeah, you, you had that, that man strength from early early doors. Yeah, you, you yeah. No gym in the world is going to give you that. Sure, it's not like. Yeah. No, I think my frame too. I'm like I was even even before I got into weightlifting, I was like a barrel chested kid, yeah. and like just even playing football, I was like I I, I scored a goal from midfield one time. Like <laughs> one time I hit a penalty shot and I uh, I hit the ball and hit the ref in the head. And the referee passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a strong kid. I was like freakishly, freakishly strong. Yeah, the, I, I've noticed since moving back to the country. I thought I was always, you know, country strong still, but it kind of wore off a bit as I was in the city. St- um, since I've moved back to the country and you're seeing these old men with yeah. huge triceps just walking around. Like, I mean, I'm just in, in the hardware the other day, just getting some screws or whatever. And every bloke around me, while they may have a bit of a belly, they all have these massive big tick backs. You're like, yeah, yeah. these would these guys would fuck up any gym gym goer. Like, they were, oh yeah, you know? for sure. I mean, comedy's definitely uh, domesticated my frame for yeah. sure. <laughs> but, but I used to look like a gorilla. Like really? people would. I actually made a conscious when I would walk down the street. If I saw a girl, I'd, I'd walk to the other side because I I made them nervous. Cause I mean, I, I do have a big scar right here and then they'd be like, and I, and I was much bigger. I mean, I think now I probably weigh, I'm going to try to do this in European measurements right here. I, I think I weigh 85 kilograms. And I think like at my biggest, I probably weighed a hundred kilograms Jesus and, Jesus. And, and wasn't fat. I mean, I was like, I was like a big dude. It was like 220 yeah, like 220, 225 pounds. That's thick. You know, That's yeah, thick. I was just, th- I was thick. And my, I was just like big old neck. Like I was a freak. I put up a picture a couple of weeks, a couple of months back of an old passport picture of me. And yeah. like I had, like same as that, I was probably in around 97, 98 when I was playing rugby. Oh, like wow. a, yes, it's like 17 inch fucking neck. I couldn't oh, find, shit. I couldn't find jeans to fit me because my thighs were like 26 <laughs> inches each. It was just... <laughs> Yeah, big fucking arse on me and stuff, just walking around like, like a fucking silverback. But I weirdly, I looked older in that picture than I do now. Like yeah. it was just because I had a big old fucking angry face on me. Like, come on, take the picture. You know, I that. <laughs> yeah, I was the same way. I was pissed off all this time. It, I didn't realize how angry of a person I was till I got married. Then my wife, my Swedish wife, was like, "Why do you always yell at the TV?" <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "What?" She's like, "Why is?" every show you watch people bleeding and then it slowly <laughs> like went from from ufc fights to rupaul's drag race to like hey let's go watch the sunset like <laughs> and isn't this a beautiful tree like i've changed a lot in the last it, year and a half yeah. isn't it like i i didn't realize that's funny as i didn't realize i'd softened until like a friend of mine had said he goes oh no you're walking around like a ball of fucking on fire petrol like all the time like you were just <laughs> yeah. thank god 
that woman came along like and stuck cam. I was like, really? Was that that bad? Oh, like, Are you fucking joking me? Everything it's you'd have so veined true. on the middle of your forehead continuously just. <laughs> oh, dude, me too. I was just it was so exhausting. So exhausting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a true yeah. point. Just walking around ready to fight all the time. Like, all right, yeah. let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And I think I had a crazy person's face. I remember one time I actually played rugby in university as well. And I remember one time I, uh, I got raked across the chest by a guy's boots. Yeah. And I had this big like mark across my neck and I'd, I'd split my lip open. Like it was, I, I it was a te- we, we played a rugby uh, match versus the Marine Corps. Oh, it was Cal that. Poly Pomona versus the Marine Corps. And it was a rough, rough game. So I was laying, my mom was driving me home and I had the seat all the way back, right? And my mom was stopped at a light and the light went from red to green, but she was talking to me. So then this car honked really hard and then went around her. And the guy looked in the car and goes, pay attention, you dumb bitch. Oh. And, then, and then I lifted the seat up. So I went up like Frankenstein, like, <laughs> and then, the guy, the guy just looked at me and he just went and his wheels like spun. <laughs> it was a monster to just sat up and uh, said, yeah. Oh dude, I just and it, it must have been the look on my face because the guy he went from aggressive to the fear of God in him. It, <laughs> it was the funniest thing I'd ever experienced, but I'm not like that in any way. And it's funny because like that's what my dad was like. And I remember yeah. my dad being like that. Like, I remember when I was a kid one time in the olden days, my, you know, you'd drive up, you'd park your car at a gas pump, and then you'd leave your car there. You'd walk inside and say, oh, I'm going to pay at number two. And so that's what my dad did. Said, oh, you know, I left me in the car, went inside, told the guy, you know, 10 bucks on number two or whatever. Um, and then the guy told him, oh, number two is broken. You got to drive up to number four. So then my dad paid 10 bucks for number four. But by the time he came out, a construction truck had pulled into four. So I'm sitting in the car and I just see my dad, kind of a little dude, you know, he only weighed like 140 pounds or probably 70 kilos, 60 kilos, you know, and he walks up and there's this massive construction worker and my dad walks up to him. And at first he was really polite and goes, Hey, sorry, this pump's broken. I paid for this one. And the guy looks at my dad goes, well, well then go pay for another one. And my dad goes, no, I paid for this one. And the guy goes, he goes, well, uh, too bad. I already moved my car. And all I, all I saw, I went to open the door and my dad looked at, cause I was a bodybuilder, you know, my dad was, and then my dad looked at me, he goes, stay in the car. And his voice <laughs> changed and his face changed. And then my dad turned around and I just saw him looking up like this, like his head was like, like this. And, and all I saw was a construction worker's face. And I saw his face just change from like anger towards my dad to just the fear of God. Like, I don't know what my dad said, but the guy got in his car and didn't drive to another pump. He drove away. <laughs> like, how did this tiny little Arab man like scare this huge construction worker like that? But I, I never wanted to be like that. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, I didn't want to be like that. It was just like, I feel like I was bitten by a vampire and I, I turned into my dad, all the things I didn't want to be, I became. And then, you know, it wasn't until I got older and then the testosterone started to run out of my body and the anger started to leave my body because I started going to therapy. I, I never wanted to be that kind of person. Is it, and what age, what age do you reckon it started to wear down as well? You started to self-reflecting too and going, ah, here, I need to wind yeah. this in a small bit. I mean, I didn't even know there was anything wrong with me until I started comedy, really. Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, <laughs> like when I started comedy, I started, I, I, you know, that's the good thing about comedy. It's one of the most honest mirrors you'll yeah. ever have. Yeah. You know, when you're an angry dude, your friends are sometimes a funhouse mirror. You know, they tell you, they're like, oh, you look skinny. And then you look away from the mirror and you don't. <laughs> you don't, you know? yeah. And I remember I had this mentor in comedy. I was, I was trying to write a joke about my dad. And it was like, it was, a, it was a dark joke. You know, it was something like, oh, have you guys ever met someone that bullied you so badly? You hated everyone with his name. And the audience starts laughing. And I'm like, that's why I hate guys named dad. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he was a bully, you know, he, he, he used to beat the shit out of me, you know? Did he? Oh yeah, dude. And he didn't mean to, he just had a temper. Like the craziest story is that one time my dad's alarm clock went off and he didn't wake up and I went to wake him, but he was a boxer and his reflex, he hit me Fuck. and I ended up, I ended up with a black eye and I was young, you know, and my dad, you know, it, it startled my dad. I think he felt bad. He left for work and I was home alone. I was a latchkey kid. 
So I was embarrassed because it got, it was getting worse and worse. And I was heading to school and I was like, shit, I don't want my dad to get in trouble. So I went in the bathroom. I used my mom's makeup to, to cover it up. Yeah. But I didn't do a good job. <laughs> you know? So I get to school and the kids look at me. They're like, that guy's wearing makeup. He's gay. And then they hit me in the other eye. <laughs> And I went home with two black eyes, you know, and, and I was like, and I think that's what made me an angry kid. I was an angry kid. I got bullied at school. I got bullied at home. And then, um, you know, but then when I got into comedy, I started making all these jokes about my dad. Right. And then the guy that was teaching me comedy goes, oh, you know how you were saying your dad's an asshole? Here's what I would say about your dad being an asshole. You know, your dad's an asshole. And I was like, and I just felt this boiling. Like, I can call my dad an asshole. Yes. You yeah, can't yeah, call yeah, my yeah. dad an asshole. And then the guy just saw the anger in me and he goes, listen, I, I'm not comfortable with you in my class. He goes in, but I'll tell you something that I haven't told anybody before. I think you're a natural comic and I, I think you can be a very good comic. And I, and I love the stuff that you're talking about, but I'm not going to have you in my class unless you go to therapy. And I was like, what? I'm like, who are you to tell me this? And, and I didn't do it and I ignored him. And then a year later, I found out that my junior high school girlfriend, this is wild, married Dick Van Dyke. Fucking yes. What? As yes. in like, like, like the, Mary the Poppins Dick, Dick Van, Van Dyke. Dyke. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Arlene Silver. She was my junior high school girlfriend. And, uh, and I remember like, she, and, and they're great together. They, they really are. They, they go great together. I mean, there's a massive age difference. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> He's, it, it's funny. I was at the wedding and I was at a table with all the high school friends. And at that, uh, that table, um, one of the girl's husbands was drunk. And, what, you know, when drunk people, like when they find out you're a comedian, they think oh. they could just tell you all the worst shit. So he starts talking. He's like, oh, isn't it crazy that she's married to that old guy? And I'm like, dude, stop it. We're in his home at yeah. their wedding in this beautiful place in Malibu. And actually, they're a great couple. And, and they're very much in love. And, you know, I don't want to fucking talk to you. And I don't want people to think I know you. So I, I go, I'm going to go to the bathroom. So I excuse myself. I go to the bathroom and outside the bathroom is this old dude in like in a seersucker suit and mm. with like gray hair, gray beard. And, and he looks at me and he goes, you must be friends with the bride. <laughs> I go, oh. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I, I went to school with Arlene. I'm like, how about you? How do you know Dick? And he goes, oh, Dick's my dad. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh and then the age difference really hit me. I'm like, holy shit. But, you know, when I was there, Arlene's brother was, became a comedian and, and it, it sparked the interest in me again to, to, to go back. And, and to, so I went to therapy and, and, you know, figured out all the stuff that was making me angry and why anger wasn't good for me and, and started writing. Like doing therapy and comedy at the same time was fucking magic. I can only imagine. Yeah, because, I mean, they're, yeah. they're rooting up all the shit that you hadn't even thought about before. And you're like, yeah. well... Now exactly. we can put this pen to paper. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great. Yeah. I don't, I think mine stem weirdly from the fact that I, I went to school in an environment of, and even I was in the town recently and it's a place as my wife who comes from a very nice place, very happy place outside Dublin. And everybody's very nice and they all hug. They all do things like hugging each other, which <laughs> just blew my fucking mind like for the day one. Like they say things like, I love you to each other. We were in this town the other day driving through and she was like, it would not inspire any smiles, would it? I went, that's the, that's the nicest thing you could say about this place, to be honest. With you. Wow. It wouldn't inspire smiles and it didn't. It was just war every day. It was just like, wow. it was just, just everybody had a hardened face. And for no yeah. good reason, really. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that, I mean, it wasn't a particularly affluent town, but it, it was just as a hard edge to everybody fighting after school wow. every day. You know, that kind of, there was just a hardened edge to everybody. And then you bring wow. that forward then, and I, I started the construction industry, even if it was en engineering and stuff, but it's still, I was working on, in a very male aggressive place. So yeah. by the time I came out the end of it, I, I think I was a bit of an anomaly when I met people on the Irish comedy scene because they were like, what the fuck is with this? You know, even though I was pleasant and good crack to hang around with, they're like, this fellow's a fucking lunatic. But <laughs> it was kind of based off of that more than anything else, I think. It was just, wow, that's wild. It seemed to be a fit in. You fit in if you're aggressive because as soon as you're in any way soft in those environments, you're just oh, going to get steamrolled. Steamrolled. Oh, 100%. Dude, in my, the neighborhood I grew up in, you... If you smiled, you got jumped. Yeah. 
you got jumped. And in, in, it's funny because in Mexican culture, they often give you a nickname that's the opposite of what you are. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. If a guy's real tall. They call him shorty. If a girl's fat, they call her slim, things like that. They used to call me Joker because I never smiled. <laughs> I never. I learned you do not laugh outdoors. You laugh at home. But if I laughed in the street, they'd look you like, why are you happy? What's your yeah. problem? And then they'd want to take out. They're like, hey, prove that they're men and jump. Because the area I lived in, too, had a lot of Mexican gangs and stuff. But they ended up, I ended up being friends with a lot of those guys after which became a big problem because when you're an immigrant, you evolve uh, like through a larger portion of the socioeconomic ladder than a normal person would because you come in more poor than you should be. And then you end up, uh, so you end up hanging out with these people. And so I was hanging out with these kids that were in gangs and going to jail. So it was a real trip when I ended up, you know, years later going to college. And then, and then when Facebook came out, I had these friends from college that were like, ah, Tamara, you're so stupid. And then my friends from their old name would be like, fuck you, bro. You call them stupid, essay. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, I'm like, no, no, separate, each, separate these guys. <laughs> oh, you got but it. it was really sweet, too, you know? It was really sweet. And I, and I love those friends, but they're just, I, I can't mix them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's, the, yeah. I'm like that i ran into a couple of guys very recently and i was like oh you haven't progressed at all boys jesus yeah. you've just gotten angrier and like it was funny one of the guys in particular he he couldn't deal with the fact that you it was very strange like he was he's my age and he could not deal with the fact that i had gone and pro- you know done something different yeah and he, he literally, while all three of the guys were chatting, we were chatting to and he just looked off at like a 45 degree angle like i wasn't there yeah, like there was a really interesting billboard over there for the full two minutes of the conversation and just walked off when they walked off. It was just it was a very wow. odd moment. And even they were kind of, well, we'll just talk through the fact that he's being really weird right now. Uh, anyway, see you around. Yeah. Just walk. Like, but you could see it was it was just eating the guy alive. You know, why, yeah. why would you fucking leave? Why would you want to go and do that thing that makes people happy? It was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's weird. It's because they look at your life through the lens of theirs. I guess right? so. Like, yeah. Like a lot of like a lot of people are like, oh, you must kill with Middle Eastern crowds. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> they <laughs> usually sometimes I do, but sometimes Middle Eastern crowds don't like me if they're conservative. Because they'll look at me as, hey, you're supposed to be one of us. Oh, you're you a detractor. Like right. Us. Yeah, you don't act like us. how come yeah. you're not acting like us? Then now that makes me look at myself and go, How come I don't get to act like that? How come you don't follow the rules? You know, how come I'm a dog on a leash and you're a dog running in the woods? You know, like yes. it's too much freedom. They get angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. an interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Because I, I, I couldn't put it together. I was like, Jesus Christ, what is going on? Like, this yeah. is, and it was a sheesh moment where we're all, the, th- the four of us barred out. It was like, whoa. All right. Yeah. Uh, right it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You made it like. For anybody listening, you have to follow Tamar. He's very easy to find. He'd be uh, one of the few people you. called Tamar. But just a little, <laughs> I like this, like the night we did, in fairness, everybody killed that night. But there was, you had nuggets. There was an, a fucking bit about a rock band. And I'm not going to burn, I'm not going to burn that bit. But <laughs> oh my God. It was, oh, oh, it just, just, lo- do you know when some, when a piece of comedy, especially as comedians, just wet washes over, you're like, oh, I want all of that on my face. Now. <laughs> it's so funny. It's such a hard joke for me to say. It breaks my heart every time. It's, but it's, I, I but you know, that's the thing. It's so hard. Like, I, like, it wouldn't make any sense me mentioning a joke like that. Also, they go, ah, you're being fucking racist, Tom. But the <laughs> fact that you have the, you're, you've got one step foot inside the line, albeit you're America, you've got a foot inside the line. You go, I can yeah. say this, my friend. Well, you now know? I got to say it. Now I got to say it because we're on the podcast, right? I know, but it's so good. So I go, uh, I go, I have a Muslim dad and a Jewish mom. So people are like, wow, how did a Muslim man convince a Jewish woman to fall in love with him? And I go, well, my dad's no regular Muslim. He was in an Arab rock band. They traveled all around the country throwing rocks at women. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and dude, <laughs> you know what's so funny? Like, oh. like Eliza Schlesinger, honestly, is my favorite comedian. Like, honestly. Oh, she's and a killer. She's such a killer. And and her audience is like, she a lot of dudes, actually. She She's so good, she transcends. But oh, there's, of course, there's uh, a feminist messages in there as well. 
not like feminist in an obnoxious way because she's she's super fair she'll say men are better at this and women are better at that whatever but there's no way i could say that joke on yeah. stage <laughs> although i would, I would personally never, i couldn't say it the comedian in me would want to be at the back of the five thousand seater last night as you tell that joke, I would want to be there. I would want to be there because you know why I'd want to be there. I'd want to see not only, yes, I love that joke, but at the same time, just to watch everybody's faces to just go, oh, did he just say that joke? Did he just yeah. say that joke? <laughs> it's like, I remember seeing yeah. Anthony Jezelnik, Uh I can't remember who he went on ahead of. It was a, she was a super famous. I, might, I, was, I was drunk and I was on the same festival, but my gigs were done that day. Oh, Christ. I love him. Oh, I just the next. Do you know what I mean? Oh, he's he's just, so good. He swings so fucking hard that yeah. you probably want to be stupid to not, you know, to not enjoy it. Yeah. You know, and he but, couldn't be a nicer guy. Oh, could I bet, not be a nicer. I was guy. chatting with him afterwards. He's a lovely man, but yeah, that, I can't. I should should have been able to remember, but it was it wasn't somebody as big as Sarah Silverman. I can't, was it Michelle Wolf? He, he was open. He was he was just happened to be on the lineup with and a load of. A, gang of girls now most people that were there were 50 50 and comedy fans but there was you know there's a group of i've seen her and a thing and i want to cast that you know and she was nothing like what they were hoping for to be honest because she came out swinging like a fucking savage you know especially when yeah. the tv cameras aren't on you you're gonna yeah. go hard you know for and, sure but jeselnik because it was the perfect mar- marriage jeselnik was on before him and to watch it more than anything because he caught co- he actually copped me watching him he goes, you seem to enjoy them more. I says, I did. They were squirming in every direction. They were furious at you. And also, you're good looking. So that was really bothering them too. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? So as comics, I think we watch it a bit yeah. differently. You're going, oh, go. Like that that joke, that rocks joke. Oh, my God. Oh, cheers. Oh, Thanks. It washed over. That means show. a lot. Dude, you guys, I, I had such a fun week with you guys. Like, you're a killer. Everybody was great. I it was I, I that was just such a fun week. I felt so it felt cool to be in the presence of such great comics. Like it's, everybody was great. It's a it's a great environment. The the laughter lounge does breed a good environment, strong because you've got to bring your game to the laughter lounge. Like there's no yeah. and it keeps the standard up then, you know, that kind of way. Plus, I think Irish people are probably there's probably a decent standard because we all think we're fucking funny. And it is it is you a, guys are. I it definitely is what it is here is it's a currency. Humor is a currency here. Like literally you can not be in any way wealthy in society, but if you're funny to talk to the guy over the fence, then you both got to be funny to each other. Like it's worth, it's worth everything more than actually what physically you got in the bank to be funnier or That's just great. as funny, you know, cause it's, I don't know what, it, where it stems from. I'm sure it's 800 years of repression or something maybe does that or whatever. I don't know, but it was, it definitely does seem to be a thing where I would, a lot of people in Ireland are good to chat. We're all yeah. fucking talkers. Long time with no TV as well. You know, we only had two channels right up until the nineties. Like so. <laughs> yeah, same in Egypt actually. But yeah, but dude, honestly, if somebody were to ask me, of all the people you've met on your travels, you're the funniest people by nationality. I, I wouldn't even hesitate. It's Irish, immediately. Like just the average person who is like who who are the funniest group of people like as a culture, Irish straight away. Yeah, they they. So many old women here, actually. The elderly women here are some of the yeah. fuck. They cut you in half with stuff. And yeah. I, I talked to a bit. I'm doing. I'm trying to work it. It's. It's. I'm not landing it right yet. I've only done it twice, so I. I need to. You know yourself. You got to twist the thing a bit, a few times. I know it's in there. Like and it, it talks about basically the last bastion of of societal acceptance of creepiness, and men have lost it. We've all lost it. Like nobody has it anymore. You can't be. You can't be creepy anymore. And I said yeah. the last bastion of good healthy creepiness that's accepted especially in an irish society is like early 60s late 50s women they can be as creepy as they fucking want and it's yeah and it's it's kind of cute it's, yeah and this woman i remember and it was coming stemming from a story from years ago i was like 18 and i didn't come home much at the weekends from college because i was away playing rugby and stuff but there's one particular weekend i came home and my parents went do you want to meet for a bite to eat in this bar that's you know it's country bar but do you want it and we'll have a drink maybe or whatever and i said yeah cool cool let's be great so i got off the bus walked over to this old woman who's actually not old like she's maybe 60 but she's fucking but she's like a raving alcoholic she's just asleep at the bar and everybody just kind of walks by that's what she does she's done it forever yeah. and she come she wakes up and she hadn't seen me since i was like 12 or whatever and she she just comes over all drunk smelling a fucking you know powers whiskey and she's like yeah <laughs> 
Uh, and she's just standing over my shoulders, just kind of grinding her flesh. And she's talking over my head to my parents, going, God, he's, he's turned into a fine looking boy, hasn't he? <laughs> and my parents are in, they're laughing their asses off, going, This is fucking funny. And he's going, and She's like whispering into my ear, God, if I was only 20 years younger. And I'm going, You were probably an ugly bitch back then, too. You know? But I didn't, because I'm only 18. I don't know what to say. And I'm welling up. Yeah. And my father thought this would be hilarious to say it. He went, Oh, hey, 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 if the two of you, I'm not, if you're, you know, if you're, be safe. That's all I'm saying. Just be safe. The two of you are going to be safe because I'm not ready to be a granddad <laughs> oh, that's just so yet. Mean. And I'm, of course, dying fucking red all the way up to my fucking scalp. I'm fucking dying with embarrassment. And without even, the ball didn't even hit the ground. And she just retorted back. She goes, I wouldn't worry about that, Bill. Bill is my old man's name. I wouldn't worry about that, Bill. You can't weld cold iron. And gives a <laughs> wink. And you're like, can't. W- <laughs> Oh, you're barren. That's basically what you're you're barren. So you can't, yes, you cannot weld. Co- oh, my. F- <laughs> but just, I like, give me an odd kiss on the cheek and one stumbled back to her stool. And, you're, and my Amazing. parents were fucking hilarious. But I was like, yeah. flip that, make that a sister. And her husband did that. And gone, the man would have been fucking shot before he even. Oh, got totally. To, you know, but yeah. it's the last healthy bastion of creepiness. Like, but I love it. That's awesome, man. There's, there's a, something extra cool that there's two, like, I love with when old women hit on you and when <laughs> plus size black women hit on you. Oh Those yeah. Are the two. Oh man. Yeah. There's nothing like, it, like a plus size black woman in, in New York when you oh. walk by and they go, Oh, you looking good, baby. Thank you so much. I know. I still, <laughs> made my day. It's still to this day. I, a lot of Irish students, they get this visa. They can get a visa it's called J one. And the J one, a visa allows you to work for 90 days in the States. You pay your taxes, but weirdly you get them all back at the end. So it's like, you've been saving, you know, but loads of them go to Boston. We went to Boston this one summer and I've never worked. This lady, her name is Trinita. And she must be tipping three, 300, 320. She was a big, old, big girl. But you I, everybody loved her because she was just yeah. never in bad form. She was always in top form, tip top form. Yeah. She'd come in, the hair would be done every day. We were security guards. We didn't secure fucking anything, but she'd <laughs> have the nails done. And she used to call me white chocolate. I was like, I know it was, so, but she, like she was pinching my ass and stuff. I was just going, oh, stop it. You know, just. <laughs> but exactly like that. Tr- Trinita, that was her name. She That's was, awesome. Oh, but still, she still brings a smile to my face to think about how you know <laughs> she could get away with it, and I was yeah. happy to let her. I'll tell you, it's one of it's people ask me all the time, like, what do you what do you miss? You know, it's been almost two years now that I've been in Europe, and honestly, one of the things I miss the most are black people, like uh, yeah. American American black people, especially in like New York. Like I have, I had, God, like half my friends were black, especially in comedy. Yeah. And it was like, and I really feel like I, I, I miss them. I miss black culture. Yeah. In, yeah, a, yeah, in a way, yeah. like, there, of course, there's black culture here, but it's not the same. It's different. You know? Oh, it's, it's completely different. Uh, totally, totally different. Born and it's out funny of a completely see, different place as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see, uh, uh, black culture is like adopted by so many cultures around the world. And you see it, like, even it's really funny. Like, I just, I, I told my wife I was trying to learn Swedish from listening to Swedish hip hop, but like Swedish hip hop, all the words I'm learning are Arabic. You know I mean? <laughs> like every other phrase is Salam Alaikum and Habibi. And I'm like, what? This is a, <laughs> like, so it's like a mashup between like American hip hop and then like North, a- North African Arabs, right. immigrants. So it's a, tr- it's such a trip, but, uh, but black culture here is amazing too. But I re- I just miss like, black culture from new york and especially new york yeah and 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 also i mean to to roll into it i suppose it's uh, probably based out of the same place why i think myself and Trinita talked about this because we're often on the desk together was that our the irish mindset and the black mindset probably comes from a lot of the same place in that being repressed sure. for so long yeah yeah you know when you come probably- out, you, you gotta be fucking you gotta laugh at it afterwards you gotta well yeah. well <laughs> That was a bit shit. Hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, that's where a lot of it comes. It's funny because even uh, you know that Eminem movie Eight Mile. Mm, yeah. It's about battle rapping. Yeah. Well, the street name for battle rapping used to be called Playing the Dozens. Right. Right. And the, the reason why they called it Playing the Dozens is is from it comes from slavery. Like they used to sell slaves one at a time unless there was something wrong with the slave, then they would sell them by the dozen. So there to be 
12 slaves in a cage and those slaves would make fun of each other. And that's where, that's where battle rapping what? came. Yeah. Wow. That's where battle rapping came from. That's, that's where your mama jokes came from. It's yes, from yeah, yeah. playing, playing the dozens and playing the dozens turned into battle rapping. It, even insult comedy, I think really stems from that. And it comes from, from pain, you know, like, or the, the fighting pain with fighting darkness with light. And so there's, I think any group of people that's gone no more than the black community for sure, but every other group that has gone through that kind of pain always finds humor. You can see it with Jewish people, you can see it with Irish people, with black people, and with lots of other people, you know. Yeah, because it was and it was a friend of mine that says it. He's he's originally from, although he he looks so Irish, it's not even funny. He's like a big, strong fellow with red hair, and he's from Miami and he's Jewish, you know. And it's he, but he fits in here. He looks just walk, walking around. It's like I've never fitted in better anywhere. Like, but <laughs> he, uh, but it he's he now he'd lived in New York, but he's he said the same thing. He's very very funny, very quick. That's why he enjoys it here so much because, you know, his father-in-law is Irish and he's just, they get, he's very fast fucker the way they talk. But he had yeah. said it the same thing. Because, sure, I mean, stand-up comedy was, you know, a Jewish thing for the most part, for a large part was created in New York yeah. for, in a lot of ways, like sure. by the Jewish people. So by the same token, yeah. yeah. You, you wrote a tweet and this is why people should follow Tamara, whatever format. You wrote a tweet that there's just, a, I love silly brains and you wrote a tweet the other day I walked away thinking about it going I'm not even going to read I'm not going I will retweet it but I need to physically tell my sister this because she loves silly thoughts as well and it was about when you were a kid that you thought all toilet bowls were carved out of giant teeth <laughs> <laughs> I really did <laughs> this is where my brain is at this is where I my brain <laughs> I was like oh porcelain is just like made from teeth so we're just pissing and pooping in teeth, <laughs> like whale teeth, dinosaur teeth. <laughs> it, Dude, um, when I was a kid, I was an idiot. I, I like every, when you're an only child, you have no older brother, no older sister. You come up with wacky ideas. <laughs> like I used to think, I didn't know what what girls' genitals looked like, but for some reason, I was positive they had one ball. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what a vagina looked like, but I was like, well, boys have two balls, girls have one ball. And I was like, and that was like a several months, I believe that. Like, just because there's no guidance. <laughs> <laughs> you know how gross a vagina would look if it had one ball? <laughs> that would be the I mean, that, Straight away, that's all a, like a half size sack hanging just out of it, just for no reason, like, a, <laughs> like the back of somebody's Stop. throat. Just. <laughs> And it was so noisy. And it was yeah, speed bike. Exactly. <laughs> it sounded like a horse running down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Just three balls banging. Up. <laughs> oh, that's filled me with so much happiness. Um, Tamara, where's the best place? I mean, like, follow your. Do you keep your your website updated? Because I mean, you're. You cover a lot of bases being where you are. I try, so. I try to. I mean, Instagram is definitely the best. Um, so it's at Tamer Cat, T-A-M-E-R-K-A-T. And then um, my website's where I put up all my shows. And um, But Instagram's where I promote every, everything and anything. I always go to Instagram first. Perfect. And then, um, but then my website's really good too for like specifics, like location and ticket prices and all that stuff. Awesome, man. Well, this has been an absolute joy. If not, we've just, oh, we, I mean, just two mustachioed men just hanging out together. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun. I can't wait to hang out again. Oh, absolutely, man. We will definitely tie you up again. This has been, it's yeah. been an absolute joy. Tamar, Kat. Yeah, you dude, very, you're very awesome. Much. You made a new fan out of me, dude. You, you killed it, Laughter Lounge. You were so fucking funny. And um, uh, you, you, it was so fun to be able to sit and laugh my ass off before I got on stage. It doesn't happen often. And it was, you're great. Oh, my, my pleasure. If anybody who can do the rocks, that's oh, I'm clipping that out by the way. That's uh, I won't read. I well, no, I'm not fucking leaving it in because it's such oh, no, it's just it's just too good. I might just keep that to myself, telling nobody else about it. You can never tell that joke again, Sam. That's for me. <laughs> for me thanks a million, dude. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. It was fun, dude. Cheers. See you soon. And my thanks again to Tamar. Like I said, give him a follow. You won't be sorry. You got a brief insight into why I follow the man. He's that 
and funny. Have a look in the show notes. It's down there. Just click on through and you can follow him on Instagram. I wouldn't be shy going over to Twitter as well for the crack because he puts up some great stuff. Anyway, like I said, live show this Sunday for the Patreon. So jump on board. Join. Join. Feel free to hide the background if you want to turn off, leave the camera off or whatever. But we'll be having a right on that there Sunday evening. If you do want to leave a review, please do. If you can't, if it's not possible on whatever app you're listening to, you know, screen grab it. Tag the show. Tell everybody you're listening. And other than that, do you know what? I'll be back next week. Have a lovely weekend. Good night, guys. Thanks.